Now he says, look, I have refined you, but not as, as severely as silver. Rather, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Okay, now, God's saying to us humans and those of us who believe that Jesus is the Savior, I have tested you, that's verse 10, in the furnace of affliction. That speaks a lot of volumes. I don't know what, I'm, like I said, this is a video. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're going through. But God, certainly, who is in control of all things, he's still on the throne. He knows exactly what he's putting you through or he's allowing you to go through. However you say it, um, he knows what he's putting through you. And he's saying, not Satan, God's saying, Yahweh is saying, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. He's testing us uh, in the furnace of affliction. That means when even when I'm going through hard times, a lot of times my pastor will say, um, you don't know, we don't know up from down. We don't know when God has given us the victory or not. That's why we should never quit on Jesus. We should never give up on him because a lot of people just, a lot of people, believers, just when God was about to open that door and, and, and give you the victory through, give the victory to himself through through you sometimes you you might give up you know the trials and satan is buffeting you so hard you give up right before you was about to be blessed i've done that and i know a lot of us do it you know but god here is saying he's the one that tested us through that furnace of affliction why then he says for my sake i will do it for my own sake he didn't say for me or anybody else. He said for his own sake. Or his own reputation again. He's going to do this. Then he says it again. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. God will not let his reputation be tarnished by. Those of us who call ourselves Christians. But are out there living disobediently. And doing things wickedly. You know. Making ourselves look like hypocrites. Because we're not following his commandments, we are doing whatever we want to do and then, then claiming, Jesus Christ unforgave me, you know, for, for going out and doing this thing repeatedly, <laughs> you know, without saying, well, you know what, if, if this sin would got me separated from God the first time and he's delivered me from it, he saved me from myself, you know, it's so a sign of true maturity Born again, work in progress, Bay Whip, that, you know, that it should behoove me not to want to go out there and get myself involved in that act. Lord, you done delivered me. Thank you. Now, he used to say, Jesus used to say, go and sin no more. Don't do it again. If you know that it's going to lead to that kind of a road where you, you was messed up the first time, you know, showing a sign of maturity. Not perfection, but allowing yourself to be perfected by the Holy Spirit. Whatever God says is perf being perfected. That's not that you're perfect. You're being perfected by the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. You know, and, you know, you, you can look at it also as I'm getting older. Do I really want to put myself, you know, ask myself and then you ask yourself, do I really want to put myself through all this turmoil again after the Lord has has graciously delivered me out of it when I know I don't deserve nothing but, but the hellfires of hell for what I've done already. I don't deserve anything, but in his mercy and grace, he's already delivered me. Why should I go back to it? Satan wants you to go back to it, you know, and he's doing everything he can because he remembers you know, how, they, how they say, uh, Satan remembers what you used to do and what you used to like, so he knows how to try to entice you. You know, and he'll say, you used to love it in the past. And that's where that can't, that thing come from, where they say, when Satan reminds you about your past, you got to, you got to trust God, you know, and remind him about his future and that you don't want to be with him when, when the hammer comes. Okay. So further, um, now he says, look, I refined you, silver affliction for my sake. I'll do it. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. 
I will not yield my glory to anyone else. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he who is first. I am also the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens. When I summoned them, at once they rose into being. So he's saying he's the only creator. There is no other. All of you, assemble and listen. Which of you has foretold what is coming? Adonai's friend will do this, or will do his will against Babel, using his arm against the Kazdim. It is I who have spoken. I have summoned him. I have brought him, and he will succeed. Okay. Could be talking about Jesus right there. I won't leave that up in the air because, you, you know, let the Holy Spirit lead and guide each you, myself and you and each one of us, whom he's talking about. To me, it sounds like he's talking about, uh, he's prophesying about, you know, Christ coming. And who will get us out of uh, will against Babel or Babylon or the Tower of Babel. You know, he was speaking about the physical Babylonians then, but he's also speaking about a symbolic of Babel. You know, the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod tried to build up a tower to go. You know, there's a lot of symbolism. Babel, the word, that word Babel or Babel also means man's, humankind's, Resentment against God. Because, you know, uh, Satan influenced Nimrod to gather all humankind, all the, the beings who were created in God's image, to stand up and raise their fist up against God. They didn't want to be ruled by God, so therefore they wanted to build this tower, which is probably why a lot of people like to go into outer space right now and trying to, trying to find where God is because we know... If we was created in his image, evidently he must be a he must not be almighty and all powerful. He's just saying that, but we're gonna go up there and find him and then um strip him of his power so we can be in charge. You know. So, you know, a prophecy comes down, he says, Adonai, the Lord's friend, will do this against Babel, using his arm against Kazdim. It is I who have spoken. I have summoned him. I have brought him, and he will succeed. Sounds to me like he's talking about Jesus. He succeeded in being put on that cross for all our sins and then rose up again three, day, three days later, you know, conquering death for all of us who have put our faith in him. Come close to me and listen to this. Since the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. God don't speak nothing in secret. There is no secret. For all those other religions out there, even if you are a part of one of those other religions that try to tell you that there's some kind of secret Da Vinci Code or something like that. See, that's why I encourage you to read the Bible for yourself. God himself, according to the holy canonical word, right here in Isaiah uh, chapter 48, verse 16, he says, I have not spoken in secret. He don't do anything in secret. Satan does a lot of stuff in secret because he's a liar. Why, if God is all true and he controls everything, who he got to hide from that? He got to go tell you something in secret or give a secret teaching to you and, and leave everybody else out. That's not what this word said. So since the time things began to be, he's saying since our human time, God is surpasses time he created time so he he's not subject to time so it says since the times began to be things began to be meaning since the time i created you us humans and all the animals and planets subject to time but god is not i have been there god made time you know and now adonai elohim has sent me and his spirit sounds like another reflection of Jesus. Jesus is saying this. You see how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when you read the word, when you read it, the Spirit lets you know this is something that, that Jesus said. If you go into, it may not be word for word, 
but in reference to something that was written in Isaiah about six, seven hundred years before Jesus showed up, Jesus says the same things, trying to hint to somebody that I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. <laughs> I'm the savior that Isaiah was hinting to. You know, okay, thus says Adonai, your redeemer. That's somebody whose redeemer is somebody who bought you back from, from where you was going. You know, bought like at a price. The Holy One of Israel. I am Adonai, your God, who teaches you for your own good. Who guides you on the path you should take. Now he's saying, if only you would heed to my mitzvot. If only, if only we who are Christians today would oh, trust and obey. The only way. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus unless we trust and obey. If we say we're Christians, but we're going to run out and go practice and participate and do all that stuff in all kinds of things that the Holy Bible, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, tells us is sinful in God's eyes, tell us it's, it's an abomination in God's eyes. You know, He's saying right here, and it says it in the New Testament too, sir, similar things. If only you would heed my commandments. Only then will your peace, which it says then, or only then, your peace would flow like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Only if you obey. Now, that God is telling all of us, only if we obey. Let me put it that way. So I'm not excluding myself. If we obey, then the peace would be like a river. You know, and our righteousness like the waves of the sea. Our descendants, our children, you know, whatever children we meant to have between now and when Christ actually come back with the clouds. Because uh, after that happened, happens that's the rapture and you know, you know that's part of the rapture and you know it won't be no time no more for that we're gonna be living forever up in there with you know won't be no more children made because we all gonna live forever we ain't gonna be need, no need to produce descendants but in between that time i don't know when that time is going to happen but in between that time that time and in the present moment you know our descendants would be numerous as the sand and our offspring countless as the as the grains their name would never be cut off or destroyed from my presence. Then he says, get out of Babel. He's not talking about the physical Babylon. He's talking about symbol symbolical Babylon. Get out of, flee the Kazdim. Meaning, get yourself out of your wickedness. You, you Stop, <laughs> you know. If you really believe that I'm, Jesus is the Savior and he's saying, if you really believe that I'm God Almighty and that Jesus is the only Savior, if you really believe that in your heart, stop participating in Babel, which means stop participating in sin. Repent, turn away before it's too late for you. Repent, turn away. It's the same message in the New Testament. Jesus dying and rising again for us, this, this fundamental message has not changed. But I know a lot of your pastors and priests and everything out there who, could, who declare themselves as priests and pastors. I'm going to tell you what, what um, what's up. If they're, if they're not telling you the truth out of the Word of God, and they're just speaking a lot, but they're not really pointing out what the Word of God says, and they're speaking and it sounds so good and it sounds so positive, it sounds like God would never do anything to hurt you. You could just go do what you want and all that kind of stuff. All right. Not only is Satan behind it, but, but I pray for those particular preachers. Just like I said, I pray for the Pope. Even though I'm not a Roman Catholic, I pray for him because he sits in a seat where he's supposed to tell the biblical truth. Not that everybody's going to follow it. Not that everybody's going to like him and pat him on the back for, for telling, standing up for Jesus and telling the truth about God's holy word. But there are a lot of people here in this nation... Um, they're pastors of churches, and for many, many years, they have had uh, 501c3 um, tax-exempt statuses and things of that nature. With these new laws coming down, uh, 
laws like, uh, you know, discrimination against uh, homosexuality, uh, discrimination against this or that or the other. You know, with these new laws in the federal government, you know, one of the things that they are going to try to do is they're going to threaten to take away uh, many churches' uh, tax-exempt status. If you, you know, this may be a prophecy to you if y'all didn't think about this. They're going to say, well, if you preach against, if you preach the word and you try to preach the truth and you preach against homosexual marriage and all that kind of stuff, we're going to take away your tax-exempt status. Therefore, um, your gathering is going to have to pay taxes. You know what I say to that? The same thing Jesus said when the Pharisees and them came and, and said, should we be paying taxes? He took that, that denarii and he said, who face on it? And he said, Caesar's. He said, well, give unto Caesar what Caesar's and God was God's. You know, I put it to you this way. God created everything, you know. God wants us to stand up for the truth, even if our governments, whatever the country you live in, it doesn't matter. Even if your national government and all that has decided unanimously, united themselves against God, if you are a true born-again Christian, you got to stand up and say, you know, you can't force anybody to do anything, but you can force yourself, if you have to force yourself, or you can stand still stand up for Jesus and not be ashamed of him and say, hey, wait a minute. This is not what Jesus preached. You can even stand up against, uh, I wouldn't say stand up against, but pray for them and stay in, uh, you know, forgive me for saying that, but more you could stand up and speak the truth when you recognize that um, some people who are ordained ministers and things, but they're allowing themselves to be afraid. Oh, if I preach the truth about this thing, I got to let these people in my church who I already know the, the word of God says not to let them in, uh, not to let them uh, in positions. You know, you can let them through the door if they're coming to be saved and they're coming to be delivered from the sins, not just homosexuality, but any sin out there. Um, yeah, we're supposed to open the door for, the, for that person because we're all sick. We all need Jesus. We're coming to see the doctor. We're all sin sick, and we're coming to see Dr. Jesus, and we're supposed to walk in there sick and come out of that church healed from what God, the Father who created everything, says sickness is and sinfulness and wickedness is. We're supposed to be getting healed from that stuff. We're not supposed to walk out that church still involved in the things that, out the church still involved in the things that that we went to church to get healed from in the first place. So, um, but that's the thing that's going to be coming up a lot. You're going to see a lot of people, uh, pastors, uh, ordained ministers, whatever they call themselves, priests. If not for popularity, they want to stay popular with the people. They are going to cater to wickedness and allow wickedness in their churches in their church building or their church facility or their group or their um, pastorship because they're afraid that the government, the man-made government, is going to take away their their 501c3 status, which means that they're going to start getting heavily taxed for um, things that uh, traditionally in this country uh, you are not being taxed for. You know, the government is going to say, well, you can still preach um, the truth out of the word of God. But we're going to tax you severely if you're not going to allow if you don't allow these um, these. And I'm not, and, and I apologize. I'm not trying to single them out. It's just that that's the issue of today. If you're not going to let people get of same sex get married in your church, if you're not going to do that, then you're against the government. Well, this government is already against the word of God. So, so there's going to be a, a big conflict coming down the pike. It's already here. Um, there's going to be a big conflict about that, you know, because uh, just like Lady Gaga and Madonna went over there to Russia and trying to force the Russian people to accept homosexuality, 
Well, the homosexual, a lot of homosexual people, not all of them, but a lot of homosexual people are starting to get the same attitude like the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, where they're going to try to force their way of life on people who do not want to be in, who want to obey God and don't want to be involved in that. They're going to get to the point where they're going to be the mob, mobsters. They're going to be the molesters. They're going to be the violent ones, forcing people to participate in things that, that God said not to. And only, only God knows how long it's going to, how many, how many years it's going to take place before he does just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah and, and sends two angels down or however he's going to do at that time and uh, to destroy all the, the people who not only did they choose to disobey God, but they, choose to, they chose to force that disobedient lifestyle on people who didn't want to be a part of it. No said about that. Now, then he says here, get out of Babel with shouts of joy. Announce it and proclaim it. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That you can proclaim that you have gotten out of that. You used to be a sinner. You used to walk that way, but you're out of it now. You know? Say, Adonai, the Lord, has redeemed his servant Jacob. He saved me. <laughs> I was living in sin and he saved me. The same thing. Same God. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm going to have to cut this short.